Yeah. All right, next up is Adam Aldrin with uh, Advanced Engineering Industries talking about the uh, Max 5 uh, engine. So, yeah. Can everyone hear me okay? Does that sound all right? Uh, we have a new innovation called the Max 5 engine, and I'm going to explain to you why today it's better than all reciprocating engines. Uh oh. There we go. Uh, I purchased this car when I was 14 years old. My parents went out of town, and uh, I fell in love with this car. The side was smashed in, the engine was out, the interior was out, and uh, my parents had been out of town for the weekend. When they came back in town, uh, I had their garage filled with pieces. The engine was disassembled and on the floor, and uh, I had to explain to them what I'd done while they were out of town. And uh, I have to tell you, I fell in love with this car. Uh, once I had it finished, uh, we did everything but a frame off. And uh, I rebuilt, that was my first engine. I rebuilt that engine, put a Ram Air 4 cam in it. Uh, it was a 389 tri-power with four speed with a Hurst shifter, dual exhaust. And uh, that's my first burnout. That's the first burnout drag racing car that we ever did. Uh, shortly after that, while I was in engineering school, uh, I worked with Brayton Engineering, developing the Indy Buick V6. And uh, this was a successful engine on the IRL circuit. We build and dyno test these engines to 900 horsepower. Uh, the advantage of this Buick V6 was that it was a stock block engine, and we could run more boost than the overhead cam engine. Uh, it had a niche uh, as far as qualifying, but the engine really wasn't robust enough to be successful on the IRL circuit. But what it did do is, while I was there, uh, we took advantage of a loophole that was in the IRL rules that allowed us to design a V8 that was a stock block aluminum V8 that we could run more boost in that was 1,100 horsepower. Uh, this particular V8 was sold off to Menard Racing uh, and then finally it was outlawed by Indy as the loophole was closed up. I don't think the Menards were too happy about that. Uh, shortly after that, once I was out of school, I got involved in this project which was an offshore V12. It's an 858 cubic inch V12 engine and uh, Keith Black and Keith Hiker in the late 80s had this concept to put together a large cubic inch V12 engine that would create uh, a large amount of torque and do it on pump gas. And so while I was at Torque Engineering, I had the opportunity to work with some engine designers, some top fuel mechanics, uh, some Indy crew chiefs, and essentially we would take their ideas, and I was the engineer behind the project, where we would, we would put down on paper what these engineers knew and what these mechanics knew, and then I was really an extension of their experience. So I would then optimize their designs, and we'd create something, uh, really the end product was better than if they'd have done it themselves or if I'd have done it myself. And this is where I really learned how to design engines and all of the fundamentals within uh, the engines that take place. One of the biggest things that we discovered, or that I discovered while doing this work, was that all of the innovations, or all of the advantages that we were trying to take care of within a reciprocating engine was always a series of compromises. And so anything that we wanted to do within the engine, we always had to compromise with something else. Essentially, it was two steps forward, one step back, uh, when trying to make a more efficient power plant uh, or, uh, and eliminating compromises. Okay. The result here of our innovation is an independent compression rotary vane modular diesel engine. And the premise behind this is that if we take the events of combustion and we split them up so they're in their own separate physical body, we can optimize each individual's uh, event in combustion, uh, increasing the efficiency overall without compromising the, the adjacent events. So 
I'm assuming all of us are familiar with the four cycles of combustion, intake, compression, ignition, and exhaust. And what's important to understand here is that all of these combustion events take place in the same physical space. And so if we'd like to increase our compression or change the compression stroke on our reciprocating engine, it compromises our intake stroke and our, our combustion stroke. Likewise, if, we, if there's an event that we'd like to achieve on our combustion stroke, it often compromises our compression stroke or exhaust stroke. So what we have to understand about a reciprocating engine is why it's inefficient. So our goal was to separate and improve the efficiency of each individual event of combustion. By doing this, we eliminate the compromises between the events, and we can tweak each individual event. Ultimately, the sum of the efficiency gains uh, results in the approved efficiency of the engine. We did this on three fronts. Mechanical efficiency, thermal efficiency, and biometric efficiency. Each individual event uh, is optimized on these three fronts. The result is the max five. We've taken the four cycles of combustion and separated them into five cycles of combustion. Intake, compression, combustion, expansion, and exhaust. Now the idea here is this really is just a modified brake cycle. So we contain these events, intake and compression, over here. We contain them in a compressor, not dissimilar from a reciprocating compressor. Reciprocating compressors make great compressors. They don't necessarily make great power generators. Okay. Then we have the combustion vent in between. And then finally, the expansion and exhaust are housed in our power generator, much like a turbine, but in our case, our power uh, generator is a rotary vane assembly. Now again, the sum of the improvements of the efficiencies minus the losses in between, because it isn't free, we're gonna lose some kind of efficiency in between, but ultimately, if we optimize our individual events and have significant gains, we'll overcome these losses in between. So it's important to understand when we look at a reciprocating engine why it's inefficient. And really, it's got a lot to do with the angle of attack between the crankshaft and the rod. So what we're looking at is the angle between the rod assembly and the crank journal throw here. So it's going to be the same as this. So while a reciprocating engine makes a great compressor, we all know air compressors, why they're, why they're, uh, why they're readily accepted in the industry, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean they make power generators. What we get is a significant mechanical advantage during compression uh, throughout the cycle because the angle of attack of this here is only at 90 degrees in one point of the rotation, meaning we have 100% mechanical advantage during a expansion stroke at one point. This is a mechanical advantage during the compression stroke. Did I, have I made that clear? I may have mixed words there. So we have to understand that what's an advantage for compression is a disadvantage for power generation. Because at the same time, as our expanding burning air fuel mixture is thrusting the piston down, we have a mechanical disadvantage here, basically a bad lever arm. It's a poor lever arm that's inefficient for 179 of the 180 degrees of rotation. Mechanical advantage, that's what we're after. That's how we're gonna make more torque. We can have a big lever arm or a small lever arm. Okay, so the idea behind our Max 5 concept is to Try to, use a, try to use the mechanical advantage of a long lever arm, but also how to take a very small combustion chamber, a large distance from the center of rotation, and control it so that we can create torque. It's the pinwheel effect. Imagine if that was a combustion chamber, 
right? And the thrust is driving this around, and that would be our torque arm there. So we're always 90 degrees to the center of rotation, uh, utilizing the expansion from our combustion to create torque. Okay. Our assembly that we developed for this is a rotary vane assembly. And we're going to call this guy Mr. Flame here. Uh, imagine during our uh, expansion stroke, we've got a burning air fuel mixture in here, and it's driving this vane around. And in this case, our lever arm is uh, the distance from his hands to the center of rotation, and the expanding gas is driving this vein around. It's really a simple concept. Making it work is a whole other story. In this case, we've got two Mr. Flames doubling our torque. And so you can imagine uh, that in a modular engine, we could stack multiple units on top of each other, uh, creating a 360 degree power stroke uh, and a smooth running uh, assembly. Okay. What we came up with was a rotary vane power generator. And this power generator has a full 180 degree power stroke. And the short of it here is that the burning air fuel uh, mixture comes in this port and drives the vane around this assembly and then that's the exhaust port. And what we've done is taken advantage of the con conservation of momentum by having many rotating components and very few reciprocating components. We don't want to throw that energy away that we spend reciprocating pistons and rods and cranks. So this is our rotary vane power generator and the force is 90 degrees to the center of rotation all of the time. So when we look at this housing, relatively speaking, we have a, uh, on a reciprocating engine, uh, we may have a two inch moment arm or a one inch moment arm for a typical uh, size engine. In this case, we have a five inch moment arm. And so we're taking that burning air fuel mixture and driving that vane around with more than two to three times as much torque as a reciprocating engine. Now we're not restricted to temperature on this. When we developed this uh, housing here, we've utilized uh, really some aerospace technology for labyrinth seals. So the, the we utilize a labyrinth seal to control the blow-by or control, control any leakage to allow this assembly to work. Because what happens is we get very high relative speeds uh, of this vein uh, heading around there. So there is not any physical contact between the vein and the housing. What this allows us to do is we've re reduced our friction and we've minimized our pumping losses. So during combustion and during expansion, we're conserving our energy with rotating assemblies and uh, very few reciprocating items relative to a uh, reciprocating engine. And what that means is when we skip a cycle, so for instance, uh, we can run this as a two stroke, a four stroke, or a six stroke. When we skip a cycle, we're not wasting energy uh, dragging around reciprocating components, uh, accumulating pumping losses. Okay. Uh, the result from our engine testing is uh, this graph. And this graph, uh, it's the effective torque on the crankshaft versus the crankshaft position. So if we take a PV diagram and you combine it with the effective torque that you get on the crankshaft, which is a combination of our effective load, half the stroke, the piston area, and the pressure in the combustion chamber, that creates our effective torque on the crankshaft. And when we ran the MAX-5, uh, the green line here is a graph of our effective torque that was created uh, using our small dyno. Now, the comparison to this is the effective torque of the same uh, components in a reciprocating engine. The same fuel injector, uh, the same compressor uh, dimensions, and what we learn is that when you look at a PV diagram, we have very high peak pressures in a reciprocating engine. But the problem is, is these peak pressures are there when we have uh, nearly no mechanical advantage on the crankshaft. So we have very high loads, but no leverage. And by the time we actually get 
uh, in rotation to where we have a 90 degree angle between the crank and the rod, we have relatively low pressure in the combustion chamber. The result is this curve. And this is the effective torque on a reciprocating engine. Likewise, uh, to compare apples to apples, this is the effective torque out of our MAX-5, where we see a higher peak torque at the top and a longer power stroke. And this is the key when we say in a reciprocating engine that it has a 180 degree power stroke, it really does not. It has a significantly shorter power stroke because we don't have any mechanical advantage at top dead center and at bottom dead center. So now what we've shown with our data is that the area under the curve is the effective work completed on the crankshaft. And the MAX-5 has a much larger area and a much longer power stroke uh, showing that we've created 34% more effective work on the crankshaft. Essentially, we made more torque out of the same amount of fuel. Okay. To overcome this, as I mentioned before, uh, there were plenty of challenges. Sealing was really the biggest uh, item. We spent a lot of time and evaluated a lot of different combinations for sealing, and essentially, uh, uh, after, after running it through uh, its course, we decided on the labyrinth type seal. Uh, lubrication, we had to make sure that this was a smooth running machine. That's what we do at Advanced Engineering. We design and build machinery. Uh, we had to make sure the functionality was there. Does it work? Does it run? Uh, can we make adequate power with it? Uh, is the physical action, is it acceptable? Are we exceeding uh, material limits? And ultimately, at the end of the day, what always proves to be successful is keep it simple. If we keep it simple, it's something we can build, we can work with it, we can get data, and we can show uh, that the efficiency of this unit is significantly better than reciprocating engines. Okay. This is a versatile power plant. And now what we've developed is a single cylinder, uh, independent compression, rotary vane uh, power plant. And because we've separated the events, now we have variable timing. So while, the, while most diesel engines are maybe 15 degrees in advance uh, on adding uh, fuel to the combustion chamber, uh, we can run as much as 240 degrees in advance on the fuel. What that means is that we can take a slow burning fuel like diesel and we can light it off well in advance in the combustion chamber while the expansion chamber is finishing its last cycle. At the same time, the uh, compression unit is uh, getting the next charge ready so that we can do this again and again. This means with, a, with this setup, we can idle lower because we have fewer reciprocating items. We can run higher speeds with the same, uh, with the same engine. We have the ability to skip cycles without with, uh, minimizing pumping losses. Ultimately, we're going to have better control over the combustion event. So when I say better control over the combustion event, we've got our compressor, we've got our power generator, and the combustion event is in the center in between the two. We can add as much fuel as we like, we can run close to stoichiometric, we can vary our compression on the fly, we can uh, change our combustion chamber temperature relative to uh, the feedback on emissions, uh, altitude, temperature, humidity. Uh, it essentially unties our hands to do what we want to do with the combustion chamber, not what we have to do with the combustion chamber. The variable timing, I've discussed that. Slower idle, uh, more power when you need it, and improve, improve fuel economy uh, goes hand in hand with it. Now, one of the items that we discovered while running the prototype is that the pressures that we see inside the rotary vane body uh, are significantly lower than what we expected. And that reduces our torque output. However, it also reduces the mass of our uh, power generator, ultimately increasing our power density. Okay. 
So is it better than a reciprocating engine? Higher speeds, lower idle speeds, the ability to run close to stoichiometric, improved efficiency, we're conserving momentum, we're improving our thermal efficiency, we're getting more work out of the same amount of fuel as the reciprocating engine. Variable compression, the ability to skip cycles with reduced pumping losses. Again, we're not dragging around those reciprocating items while we're skipping cycles. We're conserving energy with rotating mass. Okay. I'm gonna use an example of a class eight truck taking a load from Detroit to Denver. And in this case, uh, the, the truck is leaving Detroit and he's got a full load and he's, uh, he's gonna take this load to Denver and he gets on the highway uh, he's on the on-ramp and he's got his pedal to the floor. And in this case, maybe we have a uh, four-cylinder uh, rotary vane type system on there where all four cylinders are running like a two-stroke. They're firing every rotation. So he's on the on-ramp, he's putting the heat to it, he's got the throttle down. Uh, and at this point, we're getting 34% more work out of the crankshaft than a reciprocating engine. Now, he gets on the expressway, that results in better fuel economy. He gets on the expressway, he pulls the throttle back, uh, now he's maybe at half throttle, he's got a full load, and uh, in the plains, and when he's going downhill, he'll have the ability to skip cycles. And not skipping cycles on the same cylinders, but possibly sequentially, maybe we skip a cycle with cylinder one, and then cylinder two, and then cylinder three, and cylinder four. So essentially, we are only burning the fuel that we re require, and we're conserving energy with the rotating assembly. And now here's the important part. He's made it to Denver, or he's getting close to Denver, and the altitude is changing, and the engine is becoming less powerful because the air is less dense. Now we can begin to speed the compressor up. We can run more compression, getting more power out of the engine when he needs it so he can get his load uh, to its destination and burn a minimum amount of fuel. So these are the advantages in an example of the uh, MAX-5. Okay. So what does this innovation do for you? What does it do for us? Well, it gets better fuel economy. It's got a higher range of operating speeds. It's a smoother running engine with a longer power stroke. We can create more power when we need it. And again, we're not getting, we're not, make, we're not putting any more fuel or any more heat into this that we're putting into a reciprocating engine. We're just utilizing it better. We're getting more torque out of it uh, by utilizing the same amount of fuel. Uh, this is creating a versatile power plant uh, again, with cleaner emissions because we have better control of our combustion event with greater power density. All right, if I hit this button, it's gonna run. And this is, uh, we just had, got it running in July. So this was kind of short notice coming out here. I think it's gonna run if I hit the button. And uh, there's two short video clips that are going to come up here. And the first one, uh, the timing is off, and you'll hear it. It's kind of bumping and chugging and chunking, and uh, and then we went ahead and adjusted the timing and did a second run. So this is only going to take a minute, and uh, you'll get to see it. And uh, where there's smoke, there's fire. Oh no! Do I hit the play button? We made sure this worked prior to the. <laughs>
when we're running engines. It's fun to make noise and see them run. In this case, there was no muffler on this. It uh, had a piece of three quarter inch pipe sticking out of it. Uh, and the funny thing about this was when we looked at the video, neither one of us saw any smoke in the room. And uh, uh, we, were, we were pretty involved in, in what we were looking at. And uh, while it is smoking, we are burning and creating torque. And uh, it, uh, we have torn this engine down and, and reassembled it several times, creating some fuel or some oil leaks in the seals and things like that. Uh, this is our company information here. We're right south line, just a few miles down the road. And I believe I have time for questions. Um, actually, we're about up. We're up. Am I? There is uh, brochures and business cards back on the counter there. If anybody has any questions, I'll be around for uh, the next hour. I'm happy to answer questions or you can get in touch with us later on. I hope, uh, hope you enjoyed the presentation.